Mystery Bible on listeners. Thanks for joining us today for another episode of the Mystery Bible on podcast and new and improved video, as you can see if you're watching this on our new YouTube channel. We are very pleased to have Mr. Mondo Gonzalez joining us today. And if you don't know him, I will have some links for you in the show notes and he'll give a little bit of background on himself, but he is um, deeply qualified to discuss the kinds of things we're talking about and some of the current events we've been discussing. And we're very grateful for his time joining us and sharing his perspective and his thoughts on what we have going on in the world today. So Mondo, if you don't mind chatting with our listeners and telling them who you are, what your perspective is, and then answering the, a question we really like to ask our guests here, Mondo, what in the world is going on? Yeah, that, that, you know, that's a great question. You know, I, I got saved uh, just real quick. I got saved in 1993. I'm 18 years old, was not raised in a Christian home. And uh, and then immediately uh, just fell in love with the Bible, fell in love with God's word. And uh, God had provided me a lot of teachers, uh, good teachers right in the beginning. So I'm reading the Bible, I'm reading books. And then uh, I had the opportunity uh, to move to Chicago and uh, go to school at Moody Bible Institute, uh, learning about pastoral ministry in the Bible. And my, my, my concentration was Jewish studies. I thought, you know what, you know, I want to learn as much about the Jews because Jesus was a Jew. He spoke Hebrew. And, and so I, I, I decided that that was important for context. And then after that, I decided in, in order to continue my understanding of the scripture and to teach, because I was a pastor for a long time, for 16 years, is I got a uh, master's degree in Near Eastern archaeology and languages. And so th that has really helped me to stay focused on the land of Israel, the language of Israel, the people of Israel, and of course, just loving prophecy uh, from the beginning. And so, you know, in answering that question, as we look around the world now, there's no doubt, even in the last few weeks, for especially, you know, the, the problem, there's been a problem in Israel, you know, really since they started going there uh, later in some of their migrations in the late 1800s. And so, but right now people, the average Christian is like, what in the world is going on? Well, we know there's a lot going on in the Middle East and Israel is absolutely the centrality of that. And, you know, just to keep it brief, there's a reason we know that God has made promises to Israel going back into the Old Testament all the way into the new. We know that Jesus came to the land of Israel. Jesus was a Jew, uh, died for our sins, you know, and, and the gospel went out um, by Jewish people to all the world. And, and now we're recipients of that. But God's not done with Israel yet. We know that they God uh, in his Jesus's prophecy, the, the temple was destroyed in, in AD 70, in 70 AD. So, and he said they'd be cast out and all the nations dispersed. Well, he also, uh, we, we also know from the Bible that they would come back. And they did. They came back in 1948. The, one of the biggest signposts of all prophetic information as we're looking towards the end of the age. And we know that there's going to be difficulties and acrimony between Israel and its neighbors all the way up until the time that Jesus returns. And so when we look and we see it increasing, it, it, again, I'm not saying that, that uh, Jesus is coming back next week, but we know that we are at the end of the age now that Israel has returned to the land in 1948. You know, I, I think we all are feeling that. And I, I, I help uh, teach at a church as well and help pastor here in Monument, Colorado. And there's just there's a collective growing awareness of people going, something's changing. This is different. What, I mean, whether or not they're paying attention to Israel and some of the prophetic things there that are very, very important, there, there's just there's some kind of shift happening, and especially among people who are tuned into the Holy Spirit and paying attention to their Scripture, they're going. It just it feels like there's something very important developing here. So it's interesting to to hear you coming to a very similar conclusion. Um, what is it about the events? that you're seeing now, and I'm not asking you to, I just want to be be careful here. We're, we're not, our perspective here at Mr. Bible on is not to try and point to everything and say, see, there it is. There's that, this verse matches this event because prophecy is layered. It's sometimes circular, it's complicated. And as I often remind our listeners, there were smart men in, uh, you know, back at the, the, the turn of, you know, BC to AD, who had spent their entire life in the Old Testament and then completely missed the Messiah when he showed up because he didn't match their preconceived notions. So with the awareness of being very careful about our preconceived notions and trying to have some level of humility, what kinds of things are you seeing that are 
raising your eyebrows and going, oh, this is interesting, or what might this be? And, and, and I'll, I'll float some concepts and you can go a completely different direction if you like. You know, we're seeing, for example, um, a friend of mine sent a video from him standing on his, uh, his balcony in Jerusalem, and there are Iranian uh, missiles coming in. Mm -hmm. And that's new and different. And I know biblically that one particularly matters because we can draw a pretty straight line between Iran and Persia. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I'm not trying to say what that means necessarily, but I think it could mean some things. So what are you seeing? What kinds of things are you seeing that go, you know, if you're reading your Bible and you're cracking it open and you're paying attention, here's some plate, here's some things that you should be paying attention to and some, some areas that you might want to brush up on that uh, are often overlooked or have been in the background for a while and maybe shift into the foreground. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say it that way because one of the first things that I was reading about in the mid 90s was, um, you know, reading about uh, upcoming prophecies or prophecies that had not been fulfilled yet uh, in time. And, and one of those is Ezekiel 38 and 39, uh, the, the, the Gog Magog war, so to speak. And uh, I remember reading at the time, and, and the, what, what, the way it said was, Gog and Magog, and then over here it said Russia. And so I'm like, what in the world? Again, I had no clue of anything. And so you, you begin to realize that, you know, Ezekiel is, isn't using modern terms uh, in, in his prophecy from 600 BC. And so he's describing peoples and locations and geographical regions. And so when you look at the, the, the place names that he's describing or the peoples, it refers to mostly modern day Russia, as well as other uh, characters in, in the, the, that prophecy. And one of them, again, is Persia. So Iran, as we understand today, and even uh, modern day Turkey. And so you have this trifecta of nations and, and of, of Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And again, I remember reading this in the 90s going, well, okay. I mean, I could see now, I could see biblically how this is telling us that there's going to be this this uh, confederation, uh, alliance of, of groups amongst others uh, in Ezekiel 38 that come against Israel. And it says very clear in the latter days. So we know that that's clear. It's not a it's not a guesswork that it happened in history. But I remember in the especially in the late 90s going, well, Israel and Turkey are friendly. I mean, what's going on here? And so you, and Russia is everybody's villain all the time. You just exactly. put a Russian accent on somebody and he's the arch villain in any movie, you know? Yep. <laughs> and, and so even back then there was another guy, uh, another Vladimir, uh, not Putin, but uh, Zirinovsky. I remember having his mm -hmm. book and people are talking that the man who would be Gog and, and he's kind of come and gone. But as, as is typical with prophetic developments, scripture says what it says, it's going to be fulfilled, but Sometimes you just got to wait until you see how it unfolds. And so that what you said as well is my attitude is is uh, we need to have humility. We, we see these we these uh, we see these big portraits and we know that it's going to happen. How it comes to play, uh, we, we would be very wise not to commit ourselves to any one singular newspaper event. But the, the so over the past you know few years, we have seen 100 uh, percent even in the last 18 months, we've seen Russia with Putin and Iran, uh, their administration. Now they have these full, uh, uh, not only diplomatic alliances and, and economic alliances, but they have military alliances now. We, we saw recently that I Iran was providing drones for their war in Ukraine. And of course, Turkey has become very, er Erdogan of Turkey has become very adamant in his uh, criticisms of Israel and stuff. So this latest thing, uh, we know that, uh, that it, Iran has said very clearly that their their goal, their entire goal, is to wipe Israel off the map. So there's this uh, there's this acrimony and hatred that's there. But what changed over the past weekend uh, truly uh, is unprecedented. This is not just oh yeah yeah. This for them to launch over 300 uh, drones, uh, ballistic and cruise missiles at Israel was the first time that they have operated. Uh, specifically on their own. They've usually been operating through their proxies, whether it's down in Yemen, the Houthis, or uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, certainly Hamas uh, in Gaza. Also, we see Syria. Uh, Iran is the, the funder. Uh, they fund all of the troublemaking that's happening throughout the Middle East and particularly surrounding Israel. So the fact that they chose to do this launch uh, themselves 
really changed the dynamics because by God's grace, uh, we saw this uh, alliance of the United States, France, Britain, and even surprisingly, the country of Jordan going and uh, making the attempts, flying jets and other things, as well as the Israeli defense, air defenses, taking down 99% of these, these rockets. Now we know that God is going to protect Israel. They have an appointment during the coming, you know, seven-year tribulation where we believe that that they're going to come to salvation at by the end in Jesus Christ. They're not saved apart from him. But so God will protect them. And so the, these things that happen, and now we're at the, we're at the precipice of, of Israel uh, threatening. And again, you had three, over 300 a, a, attempted murder, you know, uh, crimes committed. It just, it was a graceful, gracious that God allowed uh, each of these, which could have caused hundreds, if not thousands of deaths. So Israel is going to respond. And will that continue to escalate it? Yes. Cause we know again, that at the end of the day, this Ezekiel 38 uh, alliance, uh, again, primarily of Russia, Iran, and Turkey is going to come. And what we also know, I'll just say this last thing here is that Watching this, Israel had some help this time uh, from the United States and others. But what we do know is that when Ezekiel 38 happens, which again, I'm not saying it's going to happen next week, they will be isolated and they'll be alone because God himself comes to their rescue. So all the stuff that we're seeing right now is not necessarily, oh, this prophecy was fulfilled, A and B, but we see it contributing to the overall hatred. And Iran is not going to give up until they are completely removed from the situation by God himself. Yeah. So one, one interesting thing I saw today was uh, a scientist who is familiar with how these missile defense systems work was talking about how it is miraculous that there was so little dam damage done. Like, you know, these things are designed to work well, but to work as close to perfectly as they did was, uh, was beyond the statistics that were, that even those missile defense systems would, would expect to see. Um, so shifting gears a little bit towards, you know, we want to talk to you about the, the book you wrote about the red heifer. And so one of these things in, in prophecy that's coming up is, you know, the, the temple is, is talked about and there hasn't been a temple for close to 2000 years now. Um, but Jesus talks about a temple, uh, second Thessalonians mentions a temple and, and those things are talking about a physical temple. And so, you know, right now. The, there, there's a, a pretty good understanding from most Christians that, well, something would have to happen to uh, the Dome on the Rock to be able to build a temple. But I, th I think I've heard you mention before that that's not necessarily the case, that there's other room to build a temple. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about that a little bit? Like where where else could the temple end up being? Yeah, there's... Uh... There, as people know, uh, even amongst the rabbis today, uh, no different than in Jesus' days. You know how you know have factions: the Pharisees, the Sadducees. You had the Rhodians, you had the Zealots, you had other uh, groups. Uh, certainly at the time, uh, and even the Essenes. You know, uh, out in the desert. So it's no different today. You, you, the human nature is what it is. So within the rabbinic movement today, there are a lot of factions, and each of them are looking for their own level of uh, supremacy, that they want to be the go-to people. That's just the way it is. I mean, everybody does it that way. But what's interesting is, so within that, you have archaeologists who do, do not have access to work on top of the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is huge. It's 37 acres. I mean, it's if you go up there, I've been up there many times, uh, people are surprised at how big it is. And so what you've had uh, beginning really in the 90s, uh, you have people doing as much archaeology as they can. A lot of times it's based on some of the archaeology that was done in the late late 1800s, Charles Warren, Robinson, and others who were able at the time before um, you had more, you, you had less suspicion by the Muslims at the time. And they allowed these, these European white guys to come and dig underneath in different places. So there's a lot of very interesting maps that they created back then about a lot of the tunnels that are happening underneath the Temple Mount. So a lot of what's happening in the modern understanding of the, the archaeology of Jerusalem, specifically the Temple Mount, they've come up with primarily three different uh, scenarios based on archaeology. One is that it's the, the, the original temple stood on the Dome of the Rock. I mean, right there, uh, again, in the center of the Temple Mount. Others have said it was more to the south uh, prior to where the uh, before the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built. And then uh, 
the, you know, the, the Dome of the Rock was built in the seventh century, you know, late seventh century. And so the other place is that it's in the north, just north of the Dome of the Rock. And so you have these three locations. And sometimes uh, when people discuss the, the future temple, as you said, uh, there is a Greek word, naos. It's, 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 it has the idea of, of a physical temple. Jesus was walking around in the temple. Uh, it can also refer to the body, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, your, your physical body is the temple. And it can also refer to the church in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, that the church is the temple. But we know, so you have three options when you look at these passages. Um, it doesn't mean physical temple, the body, or the church. And so some people go, don't you know that the temple is a church? We don't need a temple. Well, we know that, we know in, in John 4, Jesus said to the woman at the well, hey, there's coming a time that you're going to worship the Father and it's not going to matter. It's the, the physical location is going to be irrelevant. But the Jews obviously don't recognize that. And so when 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 Jesus predicted in Matthew 24 and Paul as well in Revelation 11 and even Daniel 9, 27, there is going to be a temple. It's a physical temple. It's not the church. It's not the physical body. There is a temple that's going to be there. And so when you look at this, there, again, you have the options. I don't think the southern uh, portion it would be considered, but the question is, is God going to uh, allow an earthquake that destroys the Dome of the Rock, uh, or is it going to be built just to the north? I've seen pl architectural plans for the building of the Third Temple. Some of them include where it is on the Dome of the Rock, but others, actually, I've seen it where there's a wall. There's like a 20-foot wall that's built just to the north of the Dome of the Rock, that the wall goes east-west, and then right on the other side of that, uh, in a location known as the Dome of the Spirits, there's a little, uh, you know, uh, a little monument that's sitting there where you can look at it, where that would be where it would be centered. And so in those plans, you have the, the, the temple being there. We don't really know, but what we do know is that it's going to happen. So how it all comes to play, not sure, but you do have, I would say this kind of, kind of enclosure on this segment, or at least in my thoughts is th these, th after 1967, when the Israel became controlling of the, the they conquered basically East Jerusalem, including the, the, the temple Mount. Uh, the Temple Mount Faithful was a group that started immediately. They were like, "This is our chance." G Gershon Solomon, and then, of course, in, in the late eight, eight, in the late nineteen eighties, you had the Temple Institute being formed. Well, you can go to the Temple Institute, Temple Institute today. They have everything done. I mean, everything is done, ready to roll. All they're waiting for is the political will uh, of the government to get the permission. Now, how that's going to work, we're not sure. But everything's done. The menorah, the altar of incense, the gold, the, the, the vestments of the priest, they have all the priests. And that's why I wrote the book on the red heifer, because the the last uh, the subtitle is the, the, the last piece of the third temple t puzzle. They have everything else ready to go, but they need the red heifer uh, to be slaughtered so they can get the ashes in order to purify not only the people who want to come up and offer a, a sacrifice, but to purify the area. So hypothetically, they could build the temple now if the geopolitical will was there. They just couldn't use it. That's why they need the red heifer. And so the fact that, you know, five red heifers were brought over to Israel in September of 22 was pretty amazing. And uh, three of them now 100% are qualified. They're of age. They need to be two years and one month. That happened in November of last year. They've talked about this, this potential having the offering and the ceremony uh, in, in, in April, April 22nd of Passover, which is coming up. And again, it doesn't need to happen on the Temple Mount. It ha actually specifically says it has to happen on the Mount of Olives. So here we are living in all these big picture things. And again, I'm not a dram I'm not dramatic. <laughs> I'm actually can be pretty boring. I'm kind of a nerd guy, but uh, or sensationalistic. But we can seriously say that this is the first time since the first century that all these pieces are in place. And then you have at least three cows, maybe four. One of them has been disqualified. And that is absolutely unprecedented in, his, in the last 2000 years. So exciting times. Again, in these big picture things, which I, I I would hope that the average Christian says, oh, really? I didn't even really know about this. Things are moving. And so it's good for us to be knowledgeable. Why? To point people to the gospel. I mean, that's why we're here to say, hey, everybody, look at what's happening. This isn't made up. I mean, there can be sensational stuff. But again, even as boring as I can be, uh, hey, this is pretty amazing. Mondo, I, I want to be. Uh, it, 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 you're you're bringing up so many amazing things, and I'm putting trying to put myself in the place of somebody who's going. Wait, what? What? Like, why are we talking about cows? Like, like mm -hmm. I, I read my Bible. You know, where I don't remember this in Revelation. You know, so there's this very there. There's a there's a a, 
a, a, a Western mindset to these things that's informed by everything from, you know, left behind to many, you know, many others. What, can you connect the dots for somebody who's going, why is he talking about heifers? What, what is this? I, I don't recall that in scripture specifically because you're, it, it, and I, I love what you're doing, but it's, it's bringing in stuff that is obvious if you're of certain Jewish heritage or have spent a lot of time in certain circles or a lot of time in Israel. And as we talk about the Temple Mount, you know, some people I've, I've been able to, to be there. And so I, I'm kind of nodding along with you. I'm really, some people are like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so <laughs> what? So it, just to, to get our audience kind of all calibrated, um, there's a pretty broad agreement that if the temple is rebuilt in Israel, that's a, a likely precondition to the kinds of things we see in Revelation, the Antichrist and some of these others. And, and that hasn't been done and it hasn't seemed possible for a very long time. And what Mondo is describing is that there are a lot of smart and dedicated people who have been working very hard to make this possible for a lot of reasons, not necessarily because they're trying to fulfill Revelation, but because there's a lot of uh, political uh, there's a lot of political spaghetti going on and everybody has their own motivations, but we're seeing these events kind of line up and up, you know, in the nineties, when people were freaking out about why 2k might be the end of the world and all these other things, one of the big things was, yeah, there's no temple in Israel. Um, and, and there are others as well, but now some of that's changing. And one of the necessary elements in that conversation is this whole conversation around the red heifer, which has become a, a hot topic recently, but I don't think very many people understand can you give a quick primer? And I know, by the way, you wrote a book on it and we encourage our, our listeners to go get a copy and read it. But can you tell people what they're going to find in there and why they should care whether or not a certain cow of a certain color is in a certain place at a certain time? <laughs> you know, that that's a great, that, that was really my goal because w- when five cows get shipped over, you know, to the to the land of Israel with much fanfare in, in, in September of 22. And, and heavy security. And heavy <laughs> security. Just, like, I mean, what is going on here? <laughs> and expensive. These things were, they, they paid a hundred, these Jewish rabbis paid a hundred thousand dollars each for the cows. They spent two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars shipping them over on a special American Airlines airplane. And so I thought, you know, at the time, I thought, you know what? I think the average Christian, uh, as we see these things develop, I said, you know, I want to write a book on this to help them to understand it, to walk them through. Why should I even care? I mean, why should I care about red cows? Well, and and the other thing too is, is you know, Christians naturally, I, I mean, I was, a, again, being a pastor, I understand this. They can be very sensitive to going, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, Jesus is the final sacrifice. Yes, we all agree. Okay, 100%. Um, Jesus is the final sacrifice. He, the, read the book of Hebrews. We know that. And so what my goal was in the book is to say, okay, we know that what Jesus said and others, that there'll be this temple, okay, as we discussed. That is a fact. Uh, but it doesn't tell us all the details about how that's going to come to be. It just gives us a snapshot there it is. It's it's existing by the middle of the, the seven year tribulation period. So one of my goals was to say, okay, I want you to get into the mindset of a Jewish rabbi. Now again, I don't agree with them. I mean, but this is their mindset, and, and like you mentioned, they don't know their fulfilling prophecy or the Book of Revelation. They certainly aren't going to try to fulfill any words that Jesus might have said. But their heart, their goal, uh, again, think about it from th- even the first century in, in John chapter five. Jesus is having this argument with the Pharisees and they're very clear. We have Moses. We don't need you. We have Moses. And he says, well, if you really follow Moses, you know, John five, you would follow me because he wrote about me. And, and so, and so for them, because they rejected Jesus at the time and still for the most part, not all Jews, but you know, cause there are those that believe in Jesus, praise the Lord. Uh, but for the most part, the Jews still reject Jesus. And so he's not even in the picture. They don't even care about him. So for him, for them, um, in their Judaism, the only place they go is Moses. So for, for them, Moses in, in, in introduced by God's grace. I mean, it wasn't bad, introduced the temple, the tabernacle, all the sacrificial systems, including the red heifer. The red heifer is in the book of Numbers chapter 19. So this isn't unbiblical the way that it was. Uh, and so for the average Jewish person today, they don't realize that Jesus fulfilled all of that. So in their mind, it's a commandment. Uh, it has not been changed. 
So why do they want to do the red heifer? Well, because Moses said to do it. Why do they want it to, op- to offer their sacrifices at the temple uh, in Jerusalem? Well, because that's what Moses said to do. So in their mind, in order to fulfill commandments of God, uh, they, they, we need to have a temple again, and we need to perform the red heifer ceremony so that we can get the ashes, which are mixed with water, water to purify everything. Why? So we can offer the sacrifices according to what Moses said. So they're doing all this in their own way. We know from other further New Testament revelation by Paul and Jesus that as they do this and they make this agreement with the Antichrist, this covenant, to fulfill the, the 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 commandments of Moses, that their goal is again to to try to honor God in this way. Well, we know they're we know they're incorrect. We know that that's not going to work. The, the blood of bulls and goats will not take away sin. Hebrews ten four says that. So as they do this, though, they're fulfilling prophecy that they don't know they're fulfilling. And we have the Christian uh, revelation of, of again John and Paul and others telling us, hey guys, this is going to happen. And this is going to be the way that God is going to allow them. They are going to make their way to redo the temple in Jerusalem. And God is going to allow them to do that. He's not going to endorse this temple. He's going to allow them to do that. And they're going to be betrayed by the Antichrist. Why? Ultimately, God says, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, this is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. We know in Hosea 5, 15, that Jesus said, I'm going to, the Messiah, I'm going to go return to heaven until they acknowledge their offense of re- rejecting Jesus. Uh, and in their distress, they will seek him. And so we know that by the end of the tribulation period, they're going to call out upon Jesus. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37 to 39, hey, you will not see me again, Jews, the leadership of the Jews, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I love the word until. That, that's a time marker. It's like, circle it. And so Jesus says, when you say, blessed is he who comes, I'll return. And we know that there's a whole study you can do this on is what, what, what does it take for Jesus to return? Well, honestly, uh, we can get Jesus to return right now, hypothetically, if we'd go to, if we convince Netanyahu and all of the Israeli government to say, we are so sorry for what we did in our history of, 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 of killing Jesus. And we repent. Jesus is the Messiah. Will you please come back? He will. If they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, he will return. Now, that's not very likely uh, to happen, but that's the purpose of the tribulation is God getting the attention of Israel. And by the time of the end, they will ask him to return. And Paul says in Romans 11, 25, all Israel will be saved. And that really is the overarching view of all of end time prophetic history. You know, something you're saying that I think a lot of people don't pick up on is, a lot of prophecy is in many ways more useful to people who haven't believed than people who have believed. Mm -hmm. I had this conversation with somebody recently where they were uh, talking about, you know, does the eclipse mean anything or, you know, all all these things. And they're valid questions and we should be paying attention. You know, we're supposed to try and look at seasons and and times. And that I think that's, it's perfectly okay to do. But one of the, the points that came up in the conversation is, if you're walking hand in hand with your Lord and Savior, it doesn't really change anything that you're doing day to day because because our hope is in Jesus Christ and our trust is in Jesus Christ and our future is in Jesus Christ and our life is in Jesus Christ. And so for the believer who's walking faithfully with the Lord, the prophecy is more of a, it, it's an affirmation, but it doesn't change a lot. Now for somebody who has not been walking with the Lord and suddenly starts seeing all these things coming together, that's where it should raise a lot of urgency. And it also gives those of us who are uh, faithfully studying the Bible something to point to, to say, hey, you need to pay attention to this. Mm-hmm. So it changes the conversation. And it, and there's this kindness of the Almighty in giving all of these specifics so that people who haven't been paying attention might have a chance to pay attention. I, I was read, uh, reading, I think it's Ezekiel 18. I was taking a look at it earlier uh, this morning. And one of the things it says in there is, the Lord doesn't want anybody to perish. Mm-hmm. He, he wants everybody to come to a knowledge of, of him and of salvation. And, and he's very patient and he's very thoughtful. And so if a very specific cow has something very specific happen at a very specific time, and it requires a whole lot of extremely specific circumstances for that to happen, it's not so that a Christian can go, oh, phew, my Bible's true. 
That's right. not the point. The point is to to get people to sit up and take notice and go, what's going on? What is this? What should I be paying attention to this? And the answer is, yeah, probably not because of the heifer itself or because of anything that the heifer does, but because of what it means and who has said that this is going to happen and what they've said is going to happen after this. So, uh, Dan, I want to pass you the mic. I know you have a another uh, question here for Mondo as well. This is a great conversation. I think this is really helpful, Mondo. Yeah. So, you know, talking about uh, you know, when Christians think about this topic, one of the reactions is like, well, we, if we're the temple, why do we care about this other temple? And, and you talked about some of that prophecy. And, and, and I, one thing I remember clearly when I was in Israel a few years ago is seeing people at the Wailing Wall mm. uh, longing for the return of the temple. And, and I remember thinking, uh, you know, if you could just accept Christ as your Savior, then you become that temple that you're longing for. And, and just what a, a visual picture that was of of what we can be like these people are just longing for the presence of god and man you can have the presence of god in your life um and, and so when we look at this stuff i would encourage everybody to go and and read the uh, i mean just the, like the first half of numbers 19 is where it talks about the red heifer and it's it's it, it's very interesting um one of the things in there is it is it talks about the red heifer ashes are to make people clean from uh, from the uncleanness that's brought by death. Mm -hmm. But it also specifically says that the priests who are burning and sacrificing the red heifer become unclean <laughs> by doing it. Mm -hmm. And and just the way that the red heifer points so directly at Christ. And then, you know, Hebrews 9, mm -hmm. 13 and 14 ties direct, the red heifer directly to Christ. And so... You know, as Christians, we can sit here and be like, yes, the red heifer is is important for for some of the stuff that, ha that needs to happen that's happening in the world right now for prophecy to be fulfilled. Uh, but it's also even more so a, a direct pointer to Jesus and who he is and what he accomplished for us, um, you know, from Jesus being sacrificed outside of Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. That was part of the red heifer. Uh, you know, that he was without blemish, which is part of the thing with the red heifer. Uh, and, and, you know, that he is saving us from the contamination of death, which he's saving us from death. Um, so, well, I mean, what would you say to people when, when thinking about the, the red heifer and, and the importance of it as, as Christians? What, sh what should people be mostly focused on? Yeah, I, I, that really is the key. And in, in I, I spent the last three chapters of the book kind of describing, you know, what's the New Testament significance and what is what, what should it mean for us and watching this unfold. And in, in one way, it again, it affirms it affirms, again, the scriptural truths of that prophetic truth, which, again, to me, I've always loved prophecy for that reason. It shows the reliability of scripture. But it is a very good apologetic for others, as we mentioned, who are, God is drawing and who's seeking and that the Bible, hey, the, God says, I'm the only one that can that can share the, the, the beginning from the end. But it also is a reminder, it, it kind of gives me, in, in, in my book, had kind of had a tone of sadness to it because as we're watching these Jewish people who are there at the, the same thing, you see them weeping. It's called the Wailing Wall. They don't really like that phrase. Um, it's also known as the Kotel, the Western Wall. But... You see, you see them there. They are longing, and, and we realize that they are missing out on what could be theirs, their own Messiah. I mean, Jesus is, is a Messiah to the Jews first. I mean, Paul says that in Romans 1.16, the gospel goes to the Jew first. And so it, it, they they are, are missing out on that. And so, there, again, there is that sadness. And I think for the Christian, it's also a reaffirmation for us of our security that we have in, in Christ and that Jesus absolutely fulfilled the entire mosaic system. I mean, all the details pointed, they all were foreshadows. Colossians 2.16 says that they were shadows, all, all fulfilled in, in him. The feasts, the Sabbath, the new moons, the sacrifices, everything points to the Lord. And so the Lord gives us this freedom to say, you know, again, um, the, the 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 veil the veil, the very veil in the temple into the into the holy uh, the holy of holies was ripped from top to bottom uh there there that's not accidental the way is open and so to me when i see some of these things 
uh, you know, watching the, the, these red heifers flown over, you're like, wow, it's like a scene out of Numbers 19, you know, but it also is a reminder that, wow, um, that's real. That There is real death. I think as Christians, we can kind of look at uh, Christianity being a little bit of sanitized version because we forget I mean, if you've ever seen an animal killed, it's, it's, it's very, it can be very dramatic, you know, especially if you're not used to it. And, and, but also to realize that the, that, that is a real thing, that there is real death that, that re- is required substitute, right? That Leviticus 17, 11, the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Again, Hebrews 9, 22, you see these verses. And so when you see some of this, you're like, and, and I would say that you see people getting angry at the Jews. You know, the, 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 that, what about the poor cows, the poor cows? And you're like, well, you know, as a Christian, I understand that. But what about, have you forgotten poor Jesus? I mean, we, we do it in a way that's, that's, that's distant. And so when you, when you have a cow, and again, I'm not endorsing any of this, but to see a cow actually be killed should remind us the reality of the, 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 the horrible nature of sin. And also you need a perfect substitute to die on your behalf. And so it is a, it is a, an object lesson. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a portrait of what Jesus truly did for us and that God takes sin serious. Uh, and, and so to me, in the sense of the Christian, it, it makes something real that's in our Bibles, especially in the book of Hebrews that I think in many ways we have forgotten about. Even with, you know, the, the reminder of the, the, the flesh and the blood and the sacrament, we still manage to, to distance ourselves in our minds from there's death and broken body and spilled blood involved here, mm-hmm. which by the way, that there is no ancient system that, that doesn't include that. And I, I, I suspect, you know, we didn't come up with that on our own. It se- seems like a, every system has some level of a, equation that includes blood and flesh and spilling of blood to address wrongs. And obviously we believe that Jesus Christ is the perfect fulfillment mm-hmm. of that. I know we don't have a lot of time left. So I, and I also am aware that there's about 19 other interesting conversations we could have because you're very well read in a lot of other areas and have a, a lot to say. And you've got prophecy watchers over your left shoulder there. And I know they, they're doing a lot of really interesting stuff. We've, we've encouraged people to take a look at some of the uh, conferences. Um, two things. What, let's start with wh- what else should somebody be paying attention to? Let's let's say let's say hypothetically, there's somebody who goes, okay, somebody sent me this podcast. This is interesting. I have a little bit of biblical background and just enough background to say this might mean something. And they're going, okay, well, it's a cow. What else should I be looking at? And I'm not trying to minimize. I mean, the red heifer is a big deal, especially when you look at. I mean, some of the, these things. These are thousands of years old, and in some cases, you know, you look at the ashes, or you know, presumably being mixed with the ashes, going back thousands. It's really fascinating stuff because it's just tying together this entire uh, this storyline of humanity for millennia. So, so setting that aside, if somebody goes, "Okay, Mondo, you have my attention," what else should I be looking at? Well, I, I think. Uh... One of my favorite, there's two passages that I, I speak about. One is uh, Mark 13, 37, where uh, Jesus says, he commands us, you know, he just got done talking about the entire scope of the end of the age. And he says, what I say to you, I say to everybody, watch. And so we have that admonition by Jesus. And, it, and within a week before that, in Luke 19, uh, 13, like 19, chapter 19, verse 13, he says, he's given a parable of, of his departure and how he's going to be delayed, you know, and that's just the way it is. But he says, you know, basically occupy until I come. And so we, we have those two admonitions and both of them should be done in perfect balance. And so one of them, we do watch, but we're to stay busy all the way. We're not going to go built a compound and, and escape from the world. We're to stay, to stay busy in the kingdom work until he returns because we don't know when that is. But part of, part of watching is looking at the, what he described. And, and Jesus wants us to watch, uh, again, not to get stressed out or worried, but as we look around, we see the world becoming increasingly global. Uh, we see the technology, we see artificial intelligence, we see uh, the, the, the goal. Co- COVID was a great example of just watching the way that, I mean, think about it in our modern world, we saw churches shut down. We saw the government, um, some some states, depending on what they were, uh, make mandates against churches being open. And so, that we we see this this global uh, conglomeration coming together. We see again not only governments, but we see uh, other groups 
uh, World Health Organization and others. Um, I would say too that the other thing that I think people should watch about is we understand that as we watch the future of of economics as it relates to the digital cashless society, uh, central bank, digital currencies, crypto, all these things, we're seeing these things come to play, which is exactly expected. I mean, Revelation 13 describes this coming future mark of the beast that'll be in the tribulation. I don't expect to see that, but we still are watching getting rid of cash getting rid of that and to be able to track things. We see this already in China, uh, World Economic Forum, like China is the greatest example. Let's all be like them. You're like, really? But it requires a reduction of liberty. And so we watch these things happen. We've seen it happen. And uh, I expect it to get more and more. I expect even the Christian church to be uh, to be squeezed more and more. Uh, physical persecution in America, I, I don't know about that. But we do see a censorship. We know people are getting canceled and censored all the time. And so I, I see that happening. And those are the things that we watch for to know, again, that the end of the age is approaching. Again, I'm not saying it's next week, but these are Jesus told us to watch. And these are just some of the things that we watch for. So uh, one thing I know that people are going to be wondering hearing this conversation is, OK, so if if, say, next week during Passover, a red heifer is sacrificed and burned, does that mean that, does that mean the end is coming next week or, you know, how, how quickly then would the temple be built? And I think the temple could be built pretty quickly if everything fell into place. The construction wouldn't take that long mm-hmm. necessarily. Um, but I, w- I would encourage listeners to, to remember that, that part doesn't, we don't really know, right? The, the temple could be operating for who knows how long before yep. the end came. And so let's not get all caught up on on timing and trying to figure out specific timing. Mm-hmm. Let's focus on what we do know, which is that Jesus is Lord and that he is is the sacrifice that we need and he is the fulfillment of everything that we need and that and that that is really what we need to come back to and keep our focus on is Christ. And and this stuff is is interesting and we need we need to be aware we were told to watch but we're ultimately told to to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbors ourselves. And so let's not get uh, let ourselves get distracted away from that by mm-hmm. by looking at all this other stuff. But also let's not ab- ignore all this other stuff, right? Uh, so thank you, Mondo, for coming on and um, appreciate all that insight. And looking forward to talking with you again. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Mondo Gonzalez, for joining us for uh, this quick conversation that was packed full of so much value. I want to give you a chance to tell our listeners where they can find you. I'm seeing over your shoulder there, you've got Pikes Peak, which is right over there for me. Um, t- t- tell us what's going on. Where can people get your book, the other work you've done? Where can they find you? And we'll make sure we uh, we post these things as well. Yeah, the uh, prophecywatchers.com is kind of our central hub. And we do have a conference coming up in Colorado Springs at the end of June. And so people can go there to find out more information. We have a, we have a, a prophecy cruise to Alaska, if people are interested in that in August. And then we have another conference that we're doing in Branson, Missouri. But again, all that information is at prophecywatchers.com and as well as, as my book. It is on, my book is on Amazon. Uh, you know, if you want to buy it there, that's that's fine. But <laughs> so we, we prefer supporting a Christian ministry. But, you know, also just just one last thing is, is we, we do, one of the other things that I work on is uh, I'm the director of our Psalm 19 project.com uh, where we, we do astrophotography of all the amazing things that God has created. So Psalm 19 project.com, you can see all of our pictures are there for free. People can check them out high resolution. It's pretty amazing what God has created. And it's just another avenue to show the majesty uh, of our God and all the things he's done for us. And it's just, it's beautiful. It's amazing. It's awesome. And again, as we know, our God is awesome. Well, well, he uh, is clearly using you in powerful ways, and we appreciate your obedience to him as it's edifying to us and to our audience, and I'm sure to uh, to many, many others. And may you be blessed in that work and and strengthened, and may he give you uh, wisdom and uh, and the endurance that it takes to to keep working on these things as the world gets more and more interesting. So thanks so much for joining us. We'll uh, we'll link to those areas and direct our listeners there, and I hope we can have another conversation soon. Um, Listeners, thanks so much for being here for this episode of Mystery Bible On and joining us for this conversation with Mr. Mondo Gonzalez. We look forward to the next episode.